Good evening. We're going to get started, so I just wanted to give you a couple minutes to settle down, and we'll be back with you in shortly. All right. Hello, everyone. Our speaker tonight is president and CEO of Junior Achievement of Washington, the largest, largest organization dedicated to giving young people the knowledge and skills they need to own their economic success, plan for their future, and make smart academic and economic choices. She has extensive experience in nonprofit management and has worked for other nonprofit agencies, such as the Make-A-Wish Foundation and the YWCA. She's a skilled fundraiser and has secured tens of millions of dollars in individual, state, and federal grants over the course of her career. With an emphasis on early childhood policy, she has worked at the state and national level, advocating for initiatives and legislation that promote children's well-being and racial and geographical equity. She holds a master's degree in early childhood education and child development from the Erickson Institute, Please help me welcome Natalie Vega O'Neill. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm going to start off here, and then I'll uh, get my, I told Mary, I'll get my pop star microphone on my ear in a little bit. But thank you all for being here. I'm so pleased to be able to share a little bit of time and your time together tonight to tell you more about my work, um, my career path, and then a little bit about junior achievement as well. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Chung Lee for this opportunity. He's an engaged uh, um, supporter of Junior Achievement, as well as PLU and the School of Business. So thank you so much. Um, I um, first wanted to start off and ask, who's heard of Junior Achievement? Yay. <laughs> Good. Who participated in Junior Achievement? Wonderful. We have some alum in the room. So um, I would not be doing my job as the CEO and President of Junior Achievement if I just didn't take up a little bit of air time to talk about Junior Achievement. And so JA um, has been around for um, 100 years. We're a global organization. Um, we have um, programs in 100 different countries around the world, and we serve about um, 10 million students average um, every year. We have a network of about 465,000 volunteers around the globe um, and really are tied together by our common mission to support um, students in really determining their path for success. So here in the United States, there are 106 JA areas around the country. Uh, we serve about 4.9 million students a year and we do have programming in all 50 states. Um, and we have a network of about 212,000 volunteers here in the US. So my responsibility in my territory is for the state of Washington. Um, the national organization celebrated its centennial last year. So it's 100 years of making change for children. Um, and JA of Washington has been around for 65 years, 67 years. And in those 67 years, we've served over 2 million students here in Washington State. Some of them are right here in this room. Um, 
And we really have um, a focus on business, which I think is a nice tie-in to what you guys do here and what you're studying and what you want to get experience to and exposure um, in. And we really are, Mary was sharing with me that, you know, the mission is around supporting and developing the future business leaders. And that's very much what we do with Junior Achievement. We just start a little bit younger. We really want to show kids the rules of the road around navigating business, navigating careers, nav navigating the economy and communities, and getting some lessons learned very early on to how to experience financial health and wellness. Um, our, our key areas, our three pillars of focus are around entrepreneurship. Um, really, how does what is the art of running a business, starting a business, thinking about being an entrepreneur, what skills do you need to do that and to experience success? Uh, talking about work readiness skills, so really developing soft skills in students to, to get them ready to be uh, a competitive employee, a competitive candidate, a good team member, um, and getting them that, ex that hands-on experience of what it's like to be in the working world. And then, of course, finance. Um, and that's what JA is best known for, is really our experience around educating children in financial literacy. And again, I, I like to, to call it, you know, giving kids the opportunity to experience financial health and wellness and understanding that no matter what income level a person gets, you can achieve financial health and wellness if you have the skill set, you have the tools, and you have the education to really be able to successfully manage your finance. Um, so here's our presence in Washington State, as I had mentioned, um, of the 106 areas around the country here in the U.S. Um, Washington State is one of 15 statewide um, regions of JA. We're kind of like a franchise organizations where there is a national office and then we each have, we're each our own independent 501c3 um, with our own board of directors and our own programs that we offer, but we are one collective organization. So we have our presence across the state in six specific regions that are noted here, and we serve about 70,000 kids um, a year in Washington State. We recognize that we're just barely scratching the surface when it comes to the potential of students that we could reach and impact because there's over a million students um, K through 12 in Washington State. We target our services for children kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, we have a couple of different ways for, um, for programs to be implemented that I'll talk about in a little bit. But I did want to spend some time, you know, just thinking about what all of you as, as business learners and business um, students understand the need, I think, much better and easier than the general public in the sense of why junior achievement and an organization like junior achievement is so needed. These are some statistics that were actually just recently put out um, by the state of the U U.S. financial capability. And we know here in Washington state that 19% of individuals reported that over the past year, their household spent more than their income. So that's really about, you know, budgeting, budgeting and balancing um, the income versus your expenses. And 43% of individuals here in Washington state don't have an emergency fund or a rainy day fund. We know that 33% of Washingtonians are paying their credit card with only the minimum due at some months of the year, and 38% of individuals can answer four or five questions on a basic five-question financial literacy quiz correctly. So we really think that uh, of the work that we're doing as preventative to helping solve the financial crisis that we see that the country is in. So while these statistics are reflective of what's happening in Washington State, um, it's, it's, it's very reflective and comparative to what's happening across the country when it comes to the lack of financial stability, the lack of financial independence, the lack of security um, that, that households and individuals experience um, in their day-to-day -day life. So we, we know that we're not, um, you know, a, an inoculation or, or a vaccine, but we understand that we can be part of the solution to prevent financial crisis and financial ruin happening for future generations. Um, our goals are really that we want to improve the financial capability for students. We want to, them to understand the importance of staying in school and really to expand the vision for what their future is going to look like and the path that it's going to be to get them to experience the success with their professional careers and choice. So how we deliver our programs um, are a couple of different ways. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with JA, you may have experienced it through our in-school programs. 
which is a train the trainer model, and we rely on volunteers. Um, as I noted before, we have you know tens of thousands of volunteers, hundreds of thousands around the country, um, that are delivering our programs every single solitary day throughout the state of Washington in schools. Those programs are free to the schools that we partner with and the classrooms that we partner with, and they're age and developmentally appropriate um, depending on the grade level and the age level of the students that we're working with. Um, our, our, again, as I had mentioned, the three pillars of our work is we're always going to focus around financial literacy, work readiness, and entrepreneurship. And we also want kids to get a hands-on experiential learning opportunity as well. And so many of you probably experienced BizTown or Finance Park if you experienced junior achievement. I see people nodding their heads. Um, and the, the, our experiential education centers, we have two of them in Washington State. One is located in Auburn, and the other is located in Yakima. And those are just hands-on mini cities that we have to teach kids about business and about financial, um, financial planning and financial budgeting. Kids are, are learning how a city runs, what it means to be a part of a community, um, how businesses impact the community. And then, and that's for the lower grades, for biz town is for our elementary students. We typically target third, fourth, and fifth graders, sometimes up to sixth graders um, in our biz town program. And then in our uh, middle and high school program, it's called Finance Park, and students are learning how to manage a budget, how to plan for their future, um, needs versus wants, how they, they can plan for their spending and be successful in that. And what we like to see, you know, kids are coming in with their schools, they're, they're experiencing directly, you know, how their decisions are gonna impact their, their financial situation, and then how smart decisions will lead to better outcomes for them. So our budget here uh, in Washington State for this year is about $5.7 million. I just wanted to share that because a lot of times people have questions about where nonprofits get their money from and how it's divided up. And so we created this pie chart just to show that, you know, we have um, a lot of income that's coming in. This changes from year to year, but we have a lot of income that comes in from court contributions. And that includes, you know, corporates and individuals and foundation contributions that help support the programs that we deliver. We have something that's called storefronts, so those experiential learning centers that I had talked about are mini cities where we partner with corporate um, and businesses to create what we call a storefront. So um, BizTown has you know, a Mariners team storefront because the Mariners are one of our um, major partners. They have an Alaska Airlines storefront. There's a BECU storefront. There's a UW Medicine storefront where kids are interacting in those storefronts and, and having responsibilities in those businesses um, to carry out throughout the day. And so we partner with these corporations to then, um, they pay for the storefronts that we have in our education centers as well. And so that's the storefront that we'll see a lot of revenue in this year in particular coming in from that because there are a lot of those um, sponsorship agreements that are, that are being renewed this year. Special events is a big part of our budget. So a big part of the way that we get more schools engaged and get more people um, involved in getting people to volunteer is through marketing and advertising and awareness building. And a lot of that can happen with our special events. So we have a lot of events that happen throughout the state throughout the year. Um, we have an event in the South Sound region. Um, our major event is in May, and it's a craft beer festival, but only for those of you that are 21 and older, um, at our facility there. And so we partner with a lot of the beer vendors and each region um, around the state has their own signature event that they're doing in their region. Our largest event of um, the year is in partnership with the Mariners, and we have a, something that we call the Dare to Dream Gala that is held at T-Mobile Park on the field, um, and it's a live auction um, and a silent auction and a dinner that we bring together. So fundraising, I say all this because fundraising and special events is a really big part of how we can function as a nonprofit and how we can bring our services to um, the students across the state. And then the last, um, uh, the last revenue stream is program fees. So while I had mentioned earlier that all of our in-school programs are free, so anything that we do to, uh, in a classroom, any programs that we bring directly to a school are at no cost at all to the schools. But when students come and visit our educational centers, either in Yakima or in Auburn, we do ask for a small student fee, and that's just really to cover our cost of delivery programs. 
so that's how we're getting our money um, at JA Washington and other other areas. Um, budgets look fairly, fairly similar when it comes to nonprofits of how we fundraise, who we go after, the corporations that we want to. So, so talking about the impact that junior achievement has, a little bit kind of leaning leading into um, or leading off of, I would say, the why we we do the work that we do is because of the impact. We're really focused at Junior Achievement on having transformational impact on the students that we support and that it not be transactional. So that what we deliver to students is something that can really change the trajectory of their life. And so we see that reflected in some of the data that we have and the statistics that we see and the outcomes that we have for students. We know that we're strengthening team working skills and some of those other soft skills when it comes to our work readiness programs that we have. Problem solving skills for kids are strengthened. We know that decision making skills and working through a team and being able to um, be strategic about decisions get, get strengthened and increased. And other things like interpersonal communication and critical thinking. And a lot of studies and research has shown that these soft skills are the most critical elements and characteristics and assets that employers want to see in employee candidates. And so that's really a big part of the work that we do with students is really teaching them how to be, as I said earlier, employable um, candidates um, and, and high quality candidates for employment. So I did want to share with all of you um, how you can get involved because we're always looking for volunteers. We have a lot of programs where we work with colleges and universities, higher ed and community colleges to get students to participate in our programs. And again, we have a, a train the trainer model um, where we provide all of the training and the support that any volunteer needs. Um, we have you know, individual um, volunteer opportunities where you can go into a classroom and deliver the programs. We have our facility in Auburn, which is very close, um, that you could go and spend a couple of hours of day down there supporting students and really talking to them about you know, business and business decisions and, and how to work in a community and what goes into working together as a community. Always volunteering at events. We always need uh, volunteers for events. Um, and also just helping us, you know, lift up our public awareness and our recognition and really being able to bring more people into the fold of the work that we're doing at JA um, and delivering our mission, again, to as many kids across the state. These are the specific... Um, opportunities for where we're looking for employment in the south or where we're looking for volunteers in the south sound region um, so we partner with a lot of schools in this region and we have specific classrooms and grades that are in need of volunteers um, our program manager for this region in the south sound is, is stephanie carrington so her her uh, contact information is up there and i know that through the leadership that we've had with dr lee is that we want to get uh, a cohort of PLU volunteers in place so that we can have some PLU experience and knowledge shared with some of the students and schools in this. So for the rest of my time, um, and we can ask questions, we'll leave questions for the end if there's any questions about junior achievement. I just wanted to share with you some of my leadership um, takeaways that I've had over the course of my career and just tell you a little bit more about me. So I, um, this is me when I was four years old. Um, and uh, the reason that this, this picture has always been significant for me and where I am with my career is because when I was four, I would play college. I would pretend that I was going away to college and, and that I, those are my books that I got, my textbooks from the bookstore. Um, my bedroom would become my dorm room. My sister and I, who's 17 months older than I am, um, she would be in her room and I would be in mine, and that would be our dorm. And that was really important to us for some reason that we pretend that we were away at college. And, and, and the reason that that has always been significant for me is because when I was in you know, primary school and even high school, I really wasn't that excited by school. I was really excited by the idea of college. And for me, when I finally went to undergrad, I felt like everything with me from academically finally clicked because I loved being able to have control over what classes I was taking and what I wanted to study and what I was really interested in learning about, which was a little bit different than some of the compulsory classes that you have to take in elementary, middle, and high school. So once I got into college, I, I studied early childhood education and child development. And I, in undergrad, I, started, I studied uh, communications. 
But this quote that's up here has really been my compass for my, pro my professional path. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a uh, German therapist. And so a lot of the work that we did, and did he did a lot of studies around relationships. Um, and I think that this has been, again, my, um, my, you know, my touchstone for how I wanted to uh, determine the path of my professional career and who I wanted to work with and where I wanted to work. Um, so a lot of the work that I decided to do early on was because I felt like my role um, in this world was to really make an impact. And so I have only worked for nonprofits my whole entire career for over 20 years. Um, and it's a different path of, of, professional, uh, of a professional career than what others take. I never had any interest in working in the for-profit world because I, it was so important to me that there be a connection with a true mission of what was the impact the organization that I was going to be working for was going to have, how we were we going to measure the impact that we were going to have, and that it was really focused on making the world a better place for kids. That, that's really what I, wanted, what I wanted to do. So some of the lessons that I've learned in leadership um, over my time, I don't think are that unusual from what other leaders say that they've learned um, over their time. But I think that they're really important because they've helped shape me as I've taken on more responsibility over the course of my career and as I've managed teams and now as I've managed um, an entire organization, all of these stay true. The things that I wanted to work on when I was you know, 22 are the same things that I want to work on now, um, that I'm 25. Just kidding. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you're all paying attention. So I think the most important thing um, that I would share with you that are at different points in your career, just to have a really good sense of who you are. Because if you do, then the decisions that you make are always going to be the right decision. And so I have worked with a lot of different organizations over my career. Before Junior Achievement, I worked for Save the Children, which is a global humanitarian organization. We're a five, they, was, they, were, they are a $500 million organization. Um, that worked primarily internationally, and I was responsible for the domestic programs. So while I'm managing a $5.7 million budget at Junior Achievement, my budget at Save the Children was $50 million. And we were just the little, like, fun part of Save the Children that everybody thought was the cute pet project, so let's do something domestically, while we're really trying to keep kids alive in Africa. And so I learned that, you know, no matter if it was a $50 million budget that I was doing, a $500 million budget or a $5 million budget, these characteristics, and I would say these traits have held true for me no matter what the instance was or what the organization. And knowing who you are, I think, has been a big one for me because if you have a good sense of who you are and you come to the table in every situation professionally with who you are, um, then good things will happen for you. Then you'll be given opportunities. Then you'll be asked to take on different pieces of leadership. Then you'll be asked to take risks. I started um, my career with the Make-A-Wish Foundation in Chicago, um, where I went to, to graduate school. Um, and I started as a data entry person for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And I always like to tell you know, the data entry people at Junior Achievement that this was my, that was my first job you know, in nonprofit. Um, and I really felt like every single position in the organizations that I worked for are integral into making sure that we deliver on the mission that we have for students. And after I left um, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, I started working for the YWCA, and that's really when I got into um, my passion around early childhood education. And it was while I was at the YWCA that I enrolled in graduate school thinking that I wanted to be a preschool teacher or thinking that I wanted to be a teacher. And then I quickly realized when I was doing my student teaching that I had no interest in being a classroom teacher because you can't really go to the bathroom when you need to on your own. And you can't really go out for coffee when you want to because you have, you're responsible, you know, for 25 kids. And so I remember telling my advisor in graduate school that I want to do something in early childhood education. And I want to do something with kids, but I don't want to be a teacher. And her response to me was, well, I don't know what you're going to do then. And so, which wasn't a great response for an advisor to give. But I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm going to figure it out then. Because if you're not going to be able to help me figure it out, then I have to find the path for myself. And that was really part of 
you know, knowing who I was and knowing that I didn't want to just fall into this track that was really easy for me to fall into in graduate school of going to be a teacher if it wasn't something that I was going to enjoy doing. And I think that leads to the next one, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. And so not to compare myself to what the other students were doing. I was the only one in my cohort in grad school that didn't want to be a teacher, that didn't want to go be an elementary or, or, or preschool teacher. And so really being able to seek out opportunities of what I was going to do to be able to find that path for myself. And so after I, I graduated, uh, finished my graduate degree, I decided to move to the West Coast. And it was through relationships, which I think is another one, a big one that isn't on here, but it really is about building relationships and building your own network. Every single one of my career moves has been because of relationships that I've made and because of my network. Um, and I would also say never burn any bridges because everything all usually comes full circle. Is you always want to keep good relationships and positive relationships with people because you never know when you're going to run into them again. And so when I moved to the West Coast, I started working for the Make-A-Wish Foundation again. I was asked to come to work for the Make-A-Wish Foundation of San Diego. And I was there um, for a couple, uh, about a year before I got recruited for a position in Los Angeles. And this was in my early 20s. Um, I was asked to come on and be a co-founder of a charter school in downtown Los Angeles. And this was in MacArthur Park of Los Angeles. It was a port of entry neighborhood. And the families um, were all kind of first generation just coming to the country. And their world was really an eight block radius in downtown LA. And so we were working with the community first through um, an Episcopalian minister who would do church in the local park. And he asked parents, what do you want for your community? What do you want to do for your community? And at first they said they wanted um, a business in their community that they could own. So they started a worker-owned janitorial company that would service all of the local businesses um, within that neighborhood. And then after several years, and they had a lot of success with that, they said, what do you, what's the next thing? What do you want to do next? So they opened up a thrift store. Same thing, it was a worker-owned thrift store um, in the neighborhood. And then they had much success with that and asked years later, what do you want to do next? And in Los Angeles, all of the good schools weren't at that time in downtown. All families that wanted their kids to go to good schools were busing their kids out to the valley or over the hills to, to different parts of uh, the surrounding areas of L.A. And so they said, we want a school. We want a high-quality school for to send our kids right here in our neighborhood. So there was an initi initiative happening, and through, you know, a, a really long story, but it was actually through a family that I nannied for while I was in grad school in Chicago, my resume was passed on to the woman that was the CEO of this charter school that was being formed. And she asked me if I wanted to come on board and be a co-founder of the charter school and really develop their early childhood program from soup to nuts, from everything, from you know picking out the tiles to working with the architect to build the building to developing the curriculum to get the program certified with the state and get a license and enroll kids. And again, I was in my early 20s, and I was woefully unqualified. I mean, I, I, and I even said that in the interview. I, I've been doing, you know, data entry at a nonprofit, and I've been doing um, event planning and event production for the Make-A-Wish Foundation in San Diego. And this is not, you know, I, I was not qualified at all. But she took a risk because she said, I see the potential in you. I see the passion in you, and I know that this is what you want to do. And it ended up being the best decision of my career because it absolutely changed the trajectory of my career. And so I think that it also comes back to, you know, she saw some of these qualities in me um, that I hadn't even seen in myself yet. And it was really important to, to continue to, to exude those qualities in everything that I did with my work. So that, that school that I, that I co-founded is still, you know, I consider my baby, right, my, my first baby. Um, we, there are now eight different campuses throughout the downtown Los Angeles area. They have an, over a 92% graduation rate for, for their high school, and they have over an 85% college acceptance rate for students that apply for college. So it's an amazing experience for me that I was able to be part of something like that so long in my career, so early in my career. And from that experience, I got really involved in the statewide initiatives that were happening in California at that time around early childhood education. And so I got into advocacy work. And I found out that I had a huge passion for when it came to advocacy work and legislative, legislative change that would focus on um, the betterment of children. 
And so when I um, was working in that arena, advocating on behalf of the school and the population that I, that I was supporting at the school that I founded, um, the Gates Foundation in Seattle was starting their early childhood initiative. They had been heavily engaged in higher ed at the time, high school and higher ed at the time. And this was going to be their first, um, you know, it, it, entry into early childhood education. So I was asked by someone that was recruited from Los Angeles to be their founding CEO. I was asked by her to come and join her in Seattle to be a founding staff member of a nonprofit in Washington State called Thrive by Five Washington. It was later called Thrive Washington. And so that's what brought me up to Seattle. Um, and then from there, I was able to um, get relationships built and make connections. Um, actually had a funding relationship with Save the Children. When I was at Thrive by Five Washington, we gave Save the Children um, a grant and was then asked if I wanted to come and join Save the Children. And so, that's how I got to save the children before I came to JA. So I think, again, my share that, my career path with you, because I think it's non-traditional in the sense that I've always wanted to be part of a mission-driven organization. I've always wanted to be able to have, say that I'm making a direct impact on changing the lives of children. And I always wanted to be part of an organization that had the same um, qualities and characteristics and core values that I do. Um, I think that a, a passion of mine as a leader, as I took on more responsibilities and became in leadership positions, was really developing those that were everyone that was around me. So giving people leadership opportunities, taking the risk on my staff and my colleagues that my mentors and previous supervisors took on me, and really giving people the opportunity to fail, I think, in a safe place is really, really important. Because it's not going to work every time. You're not always going to make the best decision. But when you have a, uh, an environment that's supportive of risk and change and people really stepping into opportunities of leadership, then, then they rise to the occasion. Um, I think for me, it's always been important to lead by example. So at different times in my, throughout my career, I've had different priorities. Um, I'm the mother of, of five-year-old twins. So my priorities have shifted in the past five years greatly from what they were you know, 10 years ago. And my family is my number one priority for me. And so I make my environment for my colleagues at Junior Achievement to reflect a very um, work-life balanced, positive environment. I want people to be able to, especially for parents, to be able to, you know, go to their child's recital or to go to the conference with, with the teachers or even for other staff to be able to go to the dentist during the day and not have to worry about taking sick sick time or things like that. Um, and so I think that by leading by example, it, it earns you the respect from people and appreciation from people and that they all also know that you're um, a leader that they can trust. Because nothing is different for me than it is for my employees when it comes to being able to balance the pressures of, of work and, and personal life. Um, one of our core values at Junior Achievement is listening to understand. It's really coming to the table um, to be an active listener. Um, we are all, I think, programmed to be able to give an answer faster than the questions asked and really being thoughtful about um, supporting one another in an environment where we're really being active listeners and wanting to understand more about, you know, the issues that is hand or a challenge that comes up or an idea that we want to try to implement, and how we as a collective group can make the decision together, but really giving people the opportunity to um, share their experiences, share their ideas, share their thoughts, and that we're engaging in active listening and that we're really listening to understand. I think um, it's always important for leaders to, to have a sense of humor, and I, I have, have fun up here, but I think it very much connects directly with being humble. Um, when you work in an environment with kids, especially when I was working um, where I had direct connection with kids every single day, you have to be humble because kids call you right on it, especially younger kids. I, ha I have a lot of stories of younger kids. I remember when I was working in Chicago and I had gotten my hair cut and I walked into the preschool classroom that I was not working in, but I was a family support specialist for the YWCA at a preschool center. And I had gotten my hair cut over the weekend, and one of the kids, it was a four-year-old classroom, 
walked in and she goes, what did you do to your hair? And I said, do you like it? And she goes, no. <laughs> and I said, all right, well, you have to maintain that humbleness throughout your career um, because it really is all feedback is good feedback, right? She didn't like it. That's okay. I did grow my hair out after that quickly again. But I think that it's really important to have humbleness and have humility and be, being really grateful for the opportunities that I've been presented and to present those same opportunities to other others as well. I, I think that the construction, constructive feedback piece is really hard. It comes with experience that, that it's, it's oftentimes as hard to deliver as it is to receive. And so again, taking these other attributes into account around listening to understand and, and you know, assuming good intent and things like that. When you can lead with that and be a leader who exhibits those qualities, you'll have success. Um, and then I think, you know, not riding the highs and not riding the lows, knowing that they'll come and go um, just as quickly as the other and not getting stuck in one place. Um, there's been a lot, I've done a lot of startups, so a lot of the, the nonprofits that I work for, we've had startups or we've had startup projects, and there are a lot of challenges that come with that. A lot of different um, things that pop up, especially when we're doing state legislation or, or really heartbreaking instances when we're working, when I've worked around um, child poverty and, and trying to, you know, break the cycle of poverty and not getting stuck in those places. And really, for me personally, it's always been connecting with and delivering on the mission of the organization that I work with and that no matter what the obstacle is that comes up or the challenge that that presents itself that we have a mission to deliver on behalf of kids and that we and then finally I'll say the best piece of advice that I was ever given was by when I was in graduate school uh, my favorite professor Dr. Aisha Ray, Ray would end every single class by telling the class she would say are there any questions and if there are questions we would answer the questions and then she would say, okay, go forth and be, be brilliant. And that's really what I wanted to leave with all of you because I think that you are, you know, the generation that's coming into the work field. You are the, the workforce. You are the generation that will help us see the change that we need to see across our country in, in really uh, much better ways, more constructive ways, more positive ways so that we can have um, a more har harmonious society. And that, you know, back to my initial slide of when I was younger, that we can leave the mark on the world for children um, that, that will make us all proud. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I do leave, with, leave it with all of you to go forth and be real. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. It's a challenge. Um, and when you work for, but it, but it has to be a priority. I think that, and it has to be a priority of the leadership to pay fair wages, to pay competitive wages when you can, and to also then offer, you know, I think salary is one benefit, right, of, of being um, an employer and being an employee, and how you can offer a variety of innovative benefit options for staff to make the work environment attractive because you know we we can't compete with Amazon even though they're literally down the street from us or Facebook who's across the street from us or Google who's now kitty quarter for us and we we can't compete with that and I think um, but what we can do is offer flexible work environments offer um, a culture of support a culture of collaboration really that we're all one team um, and those are the people that you attract when you're a nonprofit, it's mis mission centered, mission driven people, and they're knowing that the mission is the most important piece. But when I came to Junior Achievement, um, last week was my two year anniversary at Junior Achievement. And before I came on board, the previous CEO had been in place for 32 years. So I'm the first, in the 67 years of Junior Achievement, I'm the first CE female CEO and the first CEO of color. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing over the past 24 months has been about diversity, equity, inclusion, 
has been about um, kind of lifting up the quality of the organization overall and being a competitive employer and really being able to attract, retain, and develop high quality candidates for employment. And so we have raised um, all of our salaries at JA. Um, we're not hiring currently, sorry. If it was three months ago, we had a ton of openings, but we filled all of them. But we do, we have raised all of the salaries across the organization because it's been a priority for us to be able to be competitive. And so I would say that, that um, it just has to be a, a piece of the leadership, um, the, you know, of, of the, the priorities that the leadership put in place that they want to make the organization that's not only going to attract people that are mission driven, but that are going to attract people that are mission driven and feel like they're being appreciated. Um, you know, and an example of how we can be innovative and diverse in the benefits that we offer, you know, we um, do something at Junior Achievement called Summer Fun Fridays. So every other Friday from May, from Memorial Day through Labor Day, we close our offices at noon. And it's just an opportunity for staff to go out and be with their family and be with friends and to have fun and to enjoy, you know, the brief warm weather that we get here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but to do things like that, that, you know, is likely not happening at, at other um, for profit. Thanks for the question. Yes. So that's a challenge that we see. Um, even with the amazing corporate partnerships that we have and, and the you know, technology that we're integrating into our programs, knowledge management is really, really hard for nonprofits. It's not, it's not that uncommon um, that nonprofits have a hard time in knowledge management via technology. Um, and so you know, I think that for smaller, so when, when I came to Junior Achievement again a few years ago, um, I was given a desktop computer that was 13 years old, and that was what my work computer was going to be. I don't have that anymore. But I realized that, that my computer, I guess, was actually one of the new ones. And so that there were staff that were using, you know, 15-year-old computers and 10-year-old, and it was really the norm because there had been no investment, and again, or prioritization in technology. And to me, I would say, you know, in my career with nonprofits, it's absolutely about the mission and about the people, but at the same time, we also are running a business. And so we have to look at things from a business perspective as well. And um, so uh, lifting up and improving technology across the organization became a priority because it's a productivity issue. And so we, we had to have technology that works, technology that was accessible, and that, that it was re reliable as well. Otherwise, we were wasting money on lack of productivity for our staff instead of saving money because people can be more productive when they have the... We still struggle with things like, you know, we, we can't be, you know, the, the fastest when it comes to digitizing things, or we don't have all the great apps that some of the larger nonprofits have when it comes to, like, texting to give and donations and you know, think flashy things like that, but we'll get there. You know, we know that, you know, we, we want to stay, um, you know, in line with kind of our size, our, our student reach, and, where, and how we want to grow with the organization. But it, it, I think the place that we want to always stay current and on target is when it comes to getting technology in the hands of the students. So all of our curriculum at Junior Achievement comes from the national office. Um, but they just have upgraded all of our programs through our educational centers are all via technology, whereas two years ago we were still using paper and pens and kits and things like that. And they're in the process of upgrading all of the, the curriculum that JA implements to be via technology as well. So everybody's using technology now. We have to stay current. We have to stay relevant. It has to be a priority. Yeah. 
It's a great question. So Washington State does not have a required um, mandate for students that you have to receive X amount of hours of financial literacy before you graduate. It's not required, it's recommended. Some states where we've seen um, you know, a larger footprint or more impact with the, with the programs that Junior Achievement um, provides is in states where it is a required mandate, where the state legislature has determined, or the governor or someone has determined that financial literacy has to be a part of a curriculum before, before kids graduate. Um, and and I, th I think that, you know, what, what our, um, you know, value proposition is as an organization is, while there are other organizations that are focusing on, you know, career and college readiness or job training, um, we have a very laser-like focus when it comes to our three pillars, and that hasn't changed, and it's not going to change. We're the only organization that is solely focused on this. We're right now, internally, we are building our new strategic plan for our next fiscal year that's going to start in July, and we're really, um, you know, trying to find where our balance is between not trying to get into too much into the STEM field, because that's a really crowded space in the Pacific Northwest, whereas other JA areas across the country, like, you know, JA of Central Pennsylvania, there's not a lot of STEM work that's happening in STEM nonprofits or STEM opportunities for kids. And so that JA area has really integrated a lot of STEM-focused work into their programs. Um, so we want to stay relevant, and we think that the relevancy here in Washington State is really more around focusing on entrepreneurship, focusing on, on, on work readiness, and helping kids determine their path to success and what that's going to look like, and then giving people um, the skills that they need when it comes to experiencing financial health and wellness. Yes. Junior achievement's not a hard sell for any financial institution. So it's part of the Community Reinvestment Act that they have to, to de deliver some kind of financial education. So we have a lot of the, we have most of the, the largest financial institutions in Washington State are our core partners. Um, and so that's an easy sell. We fit right into what their mission and what their work is when it comes to the impact that they want to see across the communities and the improvements that they want to see in their local communities. When it comes to other nonprofits, right, competing for the same dollars from some of the larger funders, specifically, I would say, and in particular, when it comes to family foundations, because Seattle has a wonderful, um, very, very strong, very large family foundations that are here in, in the state of Washington, I really believe, because of my past in, own, you know, in solely in nonprofits, that collaboration and innovative partnerships are the key. So when we can collaborate with um, other service providers, it's really lifting all boats because we're getting services to kids. So we are looking at some innovative partnerships right now with other nonprofit organizations to say, we want to cover you know, this piece, be it work readiness or financial literacy, and they're going to cover you know, job training or something like that. Um, and I, I think that those are the opportunities that funders are looking for when they see innovative partnerships happening between service providers. I do think, though, that some of the, the ways that we set ourselves apart is because we focus on those three pillars, uh, work readiness, entrepreneurship, and financial literacy. And we're not looking at, you know, hunger or housing or homelessness or things like that. And so there are fewer organizations that are focusing on those areas of, of our prioritization and what gives us, gives us our um, competitive. Mm -hmm. So nonprofits do have bonuses, <laughs> so um, you can. And and what you want to make sure that you do in a nonprofit environment is that you balance it throughout the organization. I've worked for nonprofits where it's only been the senior leadership team that had, you know, a special merit 
increase pool or a special, you know, bonus structure. Um, you know, when it comes to benefits in particular, the federal government doesn't allow, um, you know, nonprofit leaders to get any benefits or benefit coverage that aren't uh, uh, given to all employees. So anything that I have access to, all of the employees have access to, because it would be discrimination um, if we did. I don't think we could say the same for for-profit organizations when it comes to salary or benefits or things like that. Um, but we do have bonus structures. That's not unheard of, especially when it comes to, um, you know, people that are engaged in, in fundraising. Um, it's not, it's not traditional in fundraising because it kind of, it, it, it's not necessarily in line with the professional fundraising association guidelines. But there are bonuses that are that nonprofit executives and nonprofit employees can can have. I think that we again going back to the first question, we really try to create an environment where we have competitive. Um, and I say competitive and with other nonprofits. Again, we're not competing with for profit companies. But if people, employees, and candidates are interested in working for nonprofit, we want our nonprofit salaries to be competitive with what they could get at other nonprofits within the Seattle within the Washington State region. Yes. Yeah. We, we don't, um, and I have been having to temper my ambition and my love for advocacy to hold off on doing that until my board of directors says that we can start doing that work. So we will be doing something like that in the future, and that's part of the strategic plan that we've had. Um, we've seen great success with other JA areas around the country that have engaged in advocacy. A really good example is, um, you know, JA of the, there's, five different JA areas, I think in Kentucky, and all of those JA areas came together and they hired a lobbyist and they were able to influence the legislature to direct funding toward financial literacy education and opportunities for kids. And so I want us to be able to do that. Um, and the state has a priority when it comes to, to career training and career exploration and college readiness. And so how we can get on that the map um, when it comes to opportunities for kids when they're thinking about career and college readiness. We're starting, um, we're in the midst of conversations with the business trade to think about pre-apprenticeship opportunities. There's a, an organization, a JA area that has all of the junior achievement curriculum. It's JA of Pennsylvania. They have the central Pennsylvania. The JA, specific JA curriculum is approved by the state um, as credit for pre-apprenticeship opportunities. And so we're, we're working with some of the business trades here in Washington, which will which will include some advocacy work that we're going to have to do to get some of our programs um, in in the menu of opportunities and and, and um, options for students as they engage in it. So more to come on that, but it's something that we will be doing because I think that we can have effective change and lasting change when we influence policy and legislation. At Right. So um, over my career, it's been different for the different nonprofits. So for, for junior achievement, that's what we're building out our strategic plan right now. So some of the data that I shared about the impact is looking at a macro level across the country. Um, the outcomes that that students are experiencing from that have gone through JAO programs are we have recently hired a vice president of programs and evaluation who will be building out a localized evaluation for us here in Washington State that's really going to allow us to see the impact of the work that we're doing directly here in the state we're doing that so that our funders can see where their dollars are going locally and so also that we can tell the story of the impact of JA here in Washington. So we're looking at it in two ways. You know, you can think about impact with reach, right? The number of students that we're service, serving, and there's over a million kids in K-12 education. So 
what portion of that do we want to be able to reach? And then also um, you can look at it by, um, you know, reach versus impact, right? So what is the transformational change that we're having with kids and how are we going to measure that? We do a lot of pre and post testing right now with students to see like what was their knowledge learned or gained, you know, where they were when they started with our programs and where they came when, when they finished our programs. One of the pieces that we're putting into our strategic plan is being able to kind of take what they're learning in the classroom or learning at our educational uh, centers and bring it into the home. So like sending home materials, again, utilizing technology, you know, to email or text parents of students that are participating in our program to say, these are the things that your kids did today at BizTown or at Finance Park, and here are some questions that you can ask them, you know, about their experience. We have a lot of um, students that come through. We, we had a, a student that came through our um, mobile finance park in Spokane who had said that she knew, or she was a high schooler, and that she knew that her parents were experiencing a tremendous amount of credit card debt because they argued about it a lot, but it was something that they always tried to talk about in secrecy, but she knew that it was this problem within the family, that after she went through the JA program, she said that she had the courage and the vocabulary to be able to bring up the conversation with her parents and to ask the right questions and to ask them to put a budget in place and to be able to talk about it openly so that it wasn't such a secret and to work through the problems together and see how they were going to eliminate some of their credit card debt. So how do we measure that, right? So that's a great example. That's huge transformational impact, but that's an anecdotal story. So how do we measure that impact? And that's what our evaluations um, lead is going to be doing right now to see what that's going to look like over time. I think for any nonprofit, you know, the blue sky would be a longitudinal evaluation where we would study kids, you know, from kindergarten all through, you know, eighth grade or 12th grade and be able to see the impact of our programs. I did one of those at, at Junior Achievement. It's millions and millions of dollars to do that. And that's not <laughs> in, our, in our budget in JA Washington for the next foreseeable future but we can start small and just create the local proof points to be able to say, this is how we're defining impact, right? This is what we're going to be able to measure, and this is what we're saying that our results are. Right. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Natalie, for being here tonight and being a part of our uh, leadership series here at PLU. We wanted to present you with a token of our appreciation, uh, along with one last round of applause.